Podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm James, and with me are Matt Campbell, fresh from the launch drive of a new product that's more significant than you might think, mm-hmm. as well as Richard Berry, whose brow is once again furrowed, this time over a local take on a US icon. And we'll update you on the automotive world's ready fire aim specialist in this week's Muskwatch. So stay with us. But uh, but first, Richard, yes. you've um, locked on to this week's big news for the 2019 Supercars Championship. Holy shamoli. <laughs> it's, um, look, there's uh, Shelby, Carol Shelby rolling in his grave right now. Is he dead? I mean, <laughs> he's, what? Yeah. That's, what's going what on? With, <laughs> what's going on with that? Yeah, I know. Look, this week, uh, look, I didn't even know where to begin. Uh the Mustang has joined Supercars. We've seen it in its camouflaged uh, uniform, uh, but this is the first time that the camo has come off, and we've seen the car for the first time in the metal. Well, um, in the camo, I couldn't see it at all. It's very yeah, hard. It was, it's in the jungle. Where is it? Yeah, it's I know. Difficult. I know. Yeah. Now that we can see it, wish we hadn't. And huh. people yes. uh, who are watching us on YouTube, you'll notice that the vehicle in question is currently behind us. That's the it. The there. vision of the car, you'll yep. be able to see it. As you can see, uh, it looks a little bit like a 2019 Ford Mustang, but there are some significant uh, differences and changes to the styling. Mm. Uh, There's a number of reasons, good reasons, uh, Ford tells us. Uh, The main reason, one of the reasons why it has a bulbous roof is due to it having to fit the control chassis. Yeah, uh, the the Gen 2 supercar. It's kind of uh, an evolution of the Gen 2. it's and the main issue is is that the roll cage is quite pointy at the back of the roof. Right. So if you were okay. to superimpose an FGX, the the current or the the, the former uh, Ford uh, supercar onto that, uh, it fit perfectly. Uh, but the 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 actual roll cage has got like a little horn at the back of it. So they've had to actually make the the roof line of the Mustang more humpy to fit the roll cage in. I thought rather than um, a little horn, it would have something like an air horn, you know, a car <laughs> like that. It's, <laughs> it's got to announce itself, yeah? Look, I think uh, we could see subsequent versions of uh, Mustang supercars looking a bit different. I hope but so. But at the moment, what they've had to do is they've had to make it fit the skeleton. Um, yeah, right. And the skeleton has this look, sort of this bulgy bit on the back. It's big boned. It's big boned. It, it's, um, look, let's call a spade a shovel here, yep. Richard. It's, it's ugly. It's a disaster. Mm. It's gross. Yep. It's not working. And... We've had our own uh, Mitch Talk uh, on social media, and he did a very telling match-up yes. of a photograph mm. of the car that we're talking about with an Aussie racing car, which mm. was the last-gen Mustang, and the similarities are uncomfortably close. Yeah. Oh, I think the Aussie car looks better. The, pre- <laughs> the proportions. Have you not aware Aussie racing cars are those little shrunken versions? Yeah. So with motorcycle uh, engines. Motorcycles, a high with, booster engine or something yeah, like that? with the weird proportions, yeah. which yeah. says a lot about the supercar. Uh, uh, the, the shame of it is that... Um, Mas- Mustangs around the world for racing, mm. even the NASCAR Mustang, which is a proportional nightmare yep. um, because That's it's it such, a, such a big car. Again, yep. for people on YouTube, um, you'll be able to see what we're talking about. It's a better look yeah. uh, overall. And you look at the GT4 uh, oh, Mustang, and it's yum. it's a proper Mustang. Yeah, it's amazing. a proper racing car. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what you'd love to see. Uh, on Aussie racetracks with the supercars, mm. but uh, it just hasn't worked to begin with, in my humble opinion. Look, JC, M4, I know you're a little bit disappointed, uh, mm. but sometimes ugly is faster. Uh, I thought you were going somewhere else with oh. that. <laughs> I'm very quick, actually. Uh, this, car, this, is, this, this car marks Ford's return. To supercars, have been yeah. Ford's Ford's official return. Official return. Yeah, they've been right. they've been yeah. absent since. Uh, well, they've been absent. They've been three racing years. a car you can't buy. That's yeah, exactly for right. A couple of years. Uh, and they're also they're still racing a car you can't buy because mm-hmm. that's not you know the, the similarities between that and a regular. You, you know, can't buy going, an Aussie racing car. You, you can't. can't go into a Ford dealer and no. buy one of those. You can't buy a supercar. Well, you can, no. but not that one. Not that one. Well, you can if you're Dick Johnson. <laughs> Maybe even he can't really. Um, <laughs> but. Look, uh, look. So this is a return <laughs> return to the sport for for Ford officially. Um, a lot of the design and technology which has gone into this has come from Detroit. Um, the Ford Performance. Uh, so when 
when Ford came back to uh, back to the sport, um, they also brought in their their performance division, which is sort of an in-house Ford performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, then you got the Focus and you got the Fiesta running under that Ford performance sort of sub-brand. Um, this this supercar was taken to Detroit, and um, the nose was changed, the hump was changed at the back, it was elongated. The um, the wheelbase was shortened, right. and it was all designed. So it's their fault. It's their fault. But what I'm saying is, is that. Um, <laughs> It's all designed to go faster. This is the first and last opportunity that a that a manufacturer getting into the sport has to make these massive changes to a car. Yeah. Yes. Um, so they are making all the changes they can. It will go. I mean, if you look at the front of the current, the actual Mustang, it's not very aerodynamic. No. So they've pushed that nose down as far as it will possibly go. They've gone to hell yes. with it. Yeah. Uh, because they do. They they're in it to win it. They cannot have yeah. a Mustang losing to an Opal. Well, really? also conventional okay. conventional <laughs> wisdom always mm. says that a winning racing car looks great. It's a beautiful car <laughs> yeah. mm. once it wins. So we'll probably yeah. be eating exactly. our words. And look, the yeah. other modifying factor is that as soon as you put your sponsor livery over it, yeah. um, it might mask some of what we're seeing as a fairly ungainly profile, and yeah. particularly the nose area. So who knows? What about know? that wing yeah. though? That's it's a big wing. It's a big wing. It's like bigger than a 380s wing. <laughs> you know, it looks like it looks like a sprint car's wing. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It does. Anyway, I wonder oh. if the wing like the a380 had to be built in a separate factory and put <laughs> yeah. on a barge and then taken to the main. It's got to be built in. Uh, in Ireland. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. <laughs> now, also, speaking of things that uh, we're not particularly thrilled about, we're cutting straight to our blowing a gasket oh, section. Yep. And look, Richard, once again, you're yep. in the driver's seat. This, yep. w- this was your idea. Yes. Um, I think we're really talking about stop, start. Is it time to start stopping it? Yeah. Look, uh, it's always, blowing a gasket for me is always about cyclists in general. <laughs> Just that's a given. Well, yeah, like they should get off the wow. road, hey. wow. especially if you've hey. got your children. Double wow. get off the road. It's too dangerous. Wow. Oh, look, I like cycling. I like bikes. I'm just afraid that I'm going to run you over. Not intentionally, accidentally. Well, the opinions of Richard Berry are his no, own. Roads are for cars, not for <laughs> bicycles. Roads are for cars. <laughs> roads are for cars. <laughs> right. yeah, roads are for cars. Look, the true blowing the gasket is all about stop start technology which is yep. this fuel saving you know system which stops the engine therefore not burning fuel and therefore you're saving fuel i hate it there's yeah. no need to save fuel engines are <laughs> s- engines are so efficient now that seriously it's a farce the actual amount that you are saving with a stop start system is negligible it's negligent so of course right? richard richard mm. richard yes the situation though is mm. that the major manufacturers around the world mm. are doing everything they can to, to eat try the last little bit of efficiency yep. to hit a number because yes. they need to. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're governed by restrictions, particularly in Europe, yep. around emissions mm. um, as much as consumption. So if they technically want to hit a number, they'll have to have that in there. Whether customers use it on a regular mm. basis is another question altogether. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that got my goat this week is that we had a Volvo model in the garage yep. and it took several screens deep into the media system yeah. to turn the thing off. Yeah. Um, and then once you've done that, stop the car, start it again, you're back to a default with it being yeah. engaged. So that's right. That That's kind of frustrating. Look, Yeah, look, uh, I road tested the XC40 this week, the Volvo XC40. It's a small SUV. Um, more on that later. But the stop start system in it really is intrusive. It's pretty it, rugged. It comes in as yeah. literally as soon as you now, stop. Now, um, if I'm not wrong, I think yeah. when you set up the car with your own preferences, you can disable oh, can you? it. Okay. Um, yeah. Very cool. In a lot right. of Volvos, you can mm. disable certain things if you don't like that aspect mm. of the drive experience on a permanent basis. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that, that there's does, does it there's involve a way. going under the dashboard and cutting a wire? Probably pulling a fuse. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. So, but let me just. Yeah. I want to. I want to also add my bit for this because I think engine stop start is great. Ah, oh, you would. Um, I. All right. I'm, if you must, come I'm, on. All right. I'm one of those guys who. Do you cycle as well? Yes. Oh. I cycle to work sometimes God. now. Um, That's the reason why the traffic stop start. Oh, come on, mate. Um, so the the point of it is, it does save you fuel, and no matter what argument you make mm. against it being annoying or intrusive, it does save you fuel. The ones like the Subaru system, which has a little screen in the middle, which tells you how many liters of fuel you've saved and how many minutes your car's been idle but with the engine stopped, yep. I love that. Yep. It's one of the best things because gimmick. you go... It's a gimmick. At the end, yep. if it's your car yep. and you're saving $2.50 per trip, yep. oh, isn't that worth it? You're not saving $2.50. You'd have to be driving to the moon. No. 
if if you drive fifteen kilometers and you get stuck in traffic, you will save two dollars fifty because I'm you two liters. Dash Let me get that. into the middle of this for a yes. sec. Because what we're really talking about is mm. is two things, if not more. One of them is the validity of having stop start. Okay, mm. I think we can all agree that saving fuel, except Richard, you know, because he's loopy, is <laughs> is a good thing. Mm. The other aspect of it is the quality of the stop start system. Yep. So in terms of the car's driver how uncomfortable or comfortable, perceptible or imperceptible is it? Mm -hmm. And some cars, it is frankly impossible yeah. to tell. Yeah. When the car has stopped and the engine's yeah. restarted, others, uh, much less so. And, and that's a big I'll, issue. I'll give back a little bit of ground here. Okay. I, I drove a, um, a Skoda a little uh, while ago that yes. had a stop-start system that would cut the engine at seven kilometres an hour. Yep, and coast in. And coast yep. in. So what that would mean is if you hit a speed hump, you mm. slow down for a sharp edge speed hump mm. in a car park, yeah. stops the engine, and yeah, then absolutely. it restarts it. I'm like, how much stress is this putting on the starter motor and alternator and everything else yeah. involved? I, I would even suggest that it's a safety issue as well, because mm. if you're turning right at an intersection and you slow down and you go below 7Ks and you're trying to turn right and your engine stops... You lose steering you power. You lose steering power. Yes. And then um, you're in the middle of the intersection. Uh, unless you have electric steering, mm. which is you'll have you'll have yeah. full steering power yeah. if it's electric. But yeah, some but systems with electric steering still, still cut don't. out the... Yeah, right. Yeah. Audi are known for that as well. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. All right. Uh, gasket well blown, I think. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> blew it right all right, truly. The People listening and watching should tell us mm. what they think as well. Where do you stand on this one? Yep. Yeah. It's becoming a, a, a well-worn topic, but um, wow. Let's hear what you Just say. Just get rid of it. Um, Burn the fuel. Now... <laughs> Burn them on. <laughs> Now, let me uh, switch now uh, to Matt. Mm -hmm. You've been driving a vehicle. It seems like it's the dual cab renewal season has rolled around again. It, yeah. And, and first mover in the category has been Mitsubishi. It's a pretty important one. Fill and, us in. Yeah. First mover and what a move. Uh, Mitsubishi's come in and decided, you know what, we're going to be the leaders in safety in the ute segment. Like, right. I don't think that's a sentence that I would ever have considered no, sure. in the past. If Volvo were coming in with a Ute, I would think yeah. that was true. Yeah, yeah. even Mercedes, uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. but not the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Mitsubishi's come in, and in the high-spec model, again, you have to buy a high-spec to get everything, but mm. that's not unusual in the segment either. Um, you can get everything from a blind spot and rear cross traffic to a 360-degree camera to AEB. Uh, you don't get radar cruise control, mm. but it has... The works, yeah. essentially. And this is a car that you can take off-road, serious off-road, as I did on the launch in Tasmania, uh, on the beach. You know, yep. it, It's a so fantastic It feels like a smart, strategic decision yep. that recognises what we've all sensed for a long time mm. is that these dual-cab utes are more and more family transport exactly. than anything related to a person's working life. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, it sticks it up the uh, majority of the utes in the segment and especially the ones that sell in big numbers. The the Hilux is the best-selling ute. It has none of the active safety features mm. in Australia, despite the fact that you can get them in Europe. Right. Yeah. So right. it's like Australia is being held back. I don't know whether that's got something to do with uh, crash protection bars like bull bars and nudge bars and that yeah. sort of stuff because they would have a high fitment rate. Yes. But... In Australia, the Triton does have a bull bar that's been designed specifically to cope with this new safety system. Yeah, right. So, um, obviously, the, it's a it's a big improvement. Yeah. Um, and in other in other ways, this new Triton uh, will stand up for something where it hasn't maybe in the past. Mm. All it's been in the past to a lot of people is a value focused offering, but now it's offering value for money, which is yeah, a right. different thing altogether. Right. Sure. Um, and the prices have gone up, but it justifies the increase by offering a better experience. Mm. Yeah. And is there a single cab, uh, Triton? Yeah. Or we'd, so there's all of those permutations, yeah. like single and dual cab. Um, and a club cab, two -wheel which drive, is the extra cab Four-wheel drive, so all of that. So yep. there's a million mm. different derivatives. There's, yeah, there's plenty. Um, you don't get all the safety on all the grades and with right. all the engines and so on. But yep. this is just a – it's one of those things where you can't offer everything to everyone – but it's a really good way to get people to spend up to the next level. And if they if that safety stuff matters, yeah. Yeah. then it's available to them. Like, for example, we've been saying for about three years now that Volkswagen, for the prices they charge for the Amarok, should be including a lot of this safety stuff. But it's Absolutely. just not available. You don't even get yeah. rear airbags in the Amarok. So yeah. in, your, in your bare bones, you know, um, 
bacon and egg roll and iced coffee move on the way to the job site yep. model, what do you get in that car? Well, you get a camera Yep. and sensors. If you fit the standard tray, you yep. get a five-star and cap really yeah okay so wow. it's it's all pretty mm. relative i mean it's these days when you buy the base car you're not buying an unsafe car which yeah. is you know important because uh, in the years years gone by if sure. you're if you were cheaping out on the least expensive version of the ute yes there's a good chance you weren't getting much with it so. yeah and hopefully this safety technology will filter up Mm. Uh, normally, Mercedes and you know brands, prestige brands, sort of filter their technology down. Mm. Um, but in this case, it seems to be coming from maybe yeah. a Challenger brand, or well, not really a Challenger brand, but a brand which is probably not considered to be as at as, the top of this segment, yeah, yeah. premium as others. Um, yeah, yeah it's, that's good. I think that's great. It's, and it's telling, isn't it? I remember an iconic am, I, um, campaign that Toyota ran for Hilux, yeah, uh, which was all about the unbreakable thing, which I think they've stuck with. But it was. Um, a very, uh, what what shall I say, aesthetically challenged bloke on a bus side poster, couple of teeth missing, scrappy beard, mm. looking very rough. And it said, Hilux, unbreakable, with a footnote saying, vanity mirror is unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> um, which was fantastic, but I mm. think it's of another time now. Yeah. You know, these vehicles have become so much more sophisticated yep. that that doesn't really sit well with it um, where we are in 2019. But you will be... It's an interesting point, actually, because even some of the higher spec Tritons from memory only have a vanity mirror on the passenger side. Is that right? Yeah. There you go. So you shouldn't be checking yourself out if you're <laughs> driving. I do. I check myself. I bet you do. Yeah. You know. I bet you, you do. make sure you look good. Every intersection. You'd yeah. be like... Hey, make sure just... the beard's in place. <laughs> you know, hair's done. So, yep. do, do we know, I, I recall, I, I don't know the exact year, but there was the year of the dual cab ute where pretty much everybody renewed their product. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say 2014. 14 sounds yeah. about right. Um, 14 or 15. Yeah, Toyota, 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 15, Toyota Ford, yep. everyone. Mm. Do you think this is the model cycle starting to, you know, come around again? Well, I think it's at the point where there's major refreshes happening yep. and people are getting ready for the next generation of yeah. units, which will be... Um, the there's obviously the Amarok Ranger tie up, which is going to be happening yes, in the next of course, generation. That's right. Yes. Um, and that'll probably be 2021, 22 yep. ish. Yep. Uh, the Mazda BT50 and Isuzu D Max uh, conglomeration, which yep. is probably going to be 2020 or 21. Yep. Um, and then where does that leave? Others I like know. are they going to pair up? But yeah, it's mm. such a it's such a hotly contested part of the market and growing. Yeah, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how all of that pans out. I can wait, but I can't wait. But the you know the <laughs> traditional ones out the front, or well, Toyota with the Hilux um, has kept its nose in front. Mm -hmm. But Ford's put up such a good fight with yeah. the Ranger that's yep. proved a hugely popular yep. car. But these other collaborative efforts have the potential to really upset that apple cart, don't yeah. they? You yeah, know, well, it's really going to be interesting. If you're pulling so much resource into investment on safety and technology and even, dare I say it, electric drivetrains and sure. all sorts of things, sure. it's going to be... It's going to be a different world in about four years' time when it comes to utes. Yep. Well, well, that's the thing as well, because until now, diesel's been king in terms mm -hmm. of utes. Um, yeah, we will see electric utes before bit of movement too long. There as well. yeah. That's yeah. good. All right, mm -hmm. now, speaking of driving things, we want to move to what has been uh, in the shed, what's been in the Ooh, Cars yes. Guide garage this week. And Richard, you did mention that yes. you'd been in the XC40. Just that's right. Round that out with a slightly broader thumbnail on that car. Volvo XC40. There's never been one before. It's a brand new uh, small SUV from Volvo. Uh, it's been anti highly anticipated for years. Maddie uh, went to the international launch last year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm road testing it now. We've got it in the garage for a week. Uh, I love the styling of it. You, it's, there it is behind us there. Yeah. Uh, it's got a little bit of a, a, a weird sort of kick-up panel, which goes behind the, the rear door uh, up into the C-pillar. Yep. Immediately when I drove it, I thought it was going to get in the way of my visibility. I thought it'd, it'd create a huge blind spot. It actually doesn't. When yeah. my, one of my first impressions of driving the car was that there was actually someone coming up beside me in a car. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like at the corner of your eye, but you get used to it really quickly. It you, doesn't. You also, do generally suffer from low-level paranoia anyway. I do. <laughs> like, I mean, the people coming true. into your peripheral vision, you're seeing those often. <laughs> oh. You should see him at his desk. It's unbelievable. Oh, my God. It's jumpy. Like a, Talk about on jumpy. Edge. Oh. The NAM flashbacks. It's <laughs> like a... Apocalypse now every day. Um, 
Well, it's an XC40, sorry. Uh, uh, my toddler in the back, it doesn't obstruct his vision at all because yep. that kick-up panel there is behind him. He doesn't actually, not infected by it at all. Um, Four-cylinder, two-litre, uh, turbo engine, petrol, uh, plenty of 140 kilowatts, uh, plenty of power, uh, a little bit of turbo lag. Um, but I've got to agree with you, Richard. I think mm. it's a beautiful looking little car. Yeah. It looks great. The, yeah. the proportions I've, and the way they've done it is just fabulous. Yeah, look, I mean, you, if you were looking at XC40, you should also be looking at, say, a BMW X2, a Jaguar E Pace, uh, what is the uh, Audi Q2 as mm-hmm. well, yep. those types of things, small right. luxury SUVs. And I, to be honest with you, I've driven all of those, and this is. Like, don't buy one of those until you've driven one of these. It's interesting, so, isn't it? You know, the perception in the mm. different categories. Yeah. In that, when you think about Volvo, BMW, more, more broadly, mm. Volvo, you know, has been has been trying to get into that space for a long time. Yeah. I'd argue it's still not quite there. I mean, yeah. others may have a different opinion, but in this small SUV area, it's the others have sort of come down to yes. meet Volvo, mm. and they're very much into a fist fight yeah. Um, yeah. in this part of the market, aren't they? Absolutely, and I think the Volvo absolutely kills it in so many areas, from dis- from styling to to you know, on road dynamics and performance. Yeah, it's a really good package. All right, now, uh, moving on, Matt. Yeah, uh, Sanyong. Yes, and Rexton. Rexton. What do those two words mean to you? Um, they might not mean a lot of things to a lot of people, <laughs> but to me, they mean big seven seat SUV. Yep, formerly very off roadable. Um, spent a bit of time in it recently. It's nowhere near as off roadable now <laughs> as it was. Um, what the one that you drove? The one that we Cause drove because you, you broke it. We didn't break it. No, that, what, did, that bit did come it, off, though. Well, we it, almost broke it. Yeah, no, it was fine. a few popped, teeth on the front back in. diff. Um, so we were driving the Ultimate version, uh, which was part of a upcoming comparison test. You'll have to wait and see that. Um, and the Ultimate version rides on 20-inch wheels. Um, yeah, they're and big. Yeah. yeah, it's got not enough tyre to make things comfortable over bumpy sections of road. And, in fact, we, uh, we went four up and... Richard, Richard was there. He filmed our reaction. I did a bit of a uh, iPhone, uh, yeah, selfie filming, and mm. uh, we hit these potholes. And I swear, it was like an amusement park ride, but without the fun bit. It was, <laughs> it was full on. So just quickly, yeah. Matt, run th- rattle through the other competitors that were in that comparison. Okay, so in that comparison, all between forty nine and fifty five thousand dollars. Yes, we've got the Isuzu MUX. Mm-hmm. Yep. the Toyota Fortuna. Yes. The Ford Everest, the Sangyong Rexton, and the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport. Right. So the majority of those are they're they're kind of related to Utes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yeah. that's part of the the underpinning of that whole test. Yeah. And so weirdly though, the Rexton is the only one of those five that is actually most of them are based on a ute, where the ute is based on the SUV. All right, get mm. it? Yeah, sure. So it's back to front. Yeah, sure. But it's a, it's a, it's a really sort of intriguing offering. Like, I think we all went into it expecting it to be quite an off-road sort yeah. of focused car. But the more we drove it, the more we all thought, well, wow, you know, for this much money, uh, maybe it's more of a competitor to a CX nine. Yeah, right. And um, you were saying that the equipment level was reasonably um, oh, high for the dollars. Yeah, yeah. really good. Impressive. Yeah. Uh, so things like <laughs> uh, heated front seats, heated rear seats, yep. cooled front seats, a heated steering wheel, dual zone climate control, a sunroof, yep. quilted, quilted leather. Yeah, on the doors, door trim, right. quilted yeah. leather doors. And on the seats yeah. and on the dash. It's It right. was like it was, all amazing. of us got in there and went, wow. I think yeah. one of the comments from one of our testers was, this is better than a Lexus. Yeah. yeah, wow. So, all right. Pretty big praise. Okay, well, that's that's something to keep your eye out for mm-hmm. is um is that five five, five car, five uh, five vehicle, seven seat, three row, you know, SUVs, it was all of that. Only one winner though. I want to go back. I'll run that out with um I had a, a quick steer in the Jaguar I-Pace. Oh yeah. Uh, which is a full electric and I know um you guys have had a, a steer at various times as well. It's about $160,000 wow. before you you put it on the road, so it's a substantial number. The thing that I liked about it was mm. that it's quick. You know, electric cars typically are because of the a way the way in which an electric motor behaves for acceleration. But Jaguar has uh, matched it with their dynamic audio, which is a, a synthetic uh, noise yep. that 
in the lower kind of speed range is like a thrumming little drumming noise. Mm -hmm. But as you Mm -hmm. keep going, Mm -hmm. if you've got some space, it goes full Jetsons. Like it's this funny little... But um, is that projected outside the car or As inside? well. There's a, there's a separate system yeah. that will make a noise to keep pedestrians aware of the fact that yeah. there's a car around. But inside, this matches the throttle position yeah. uh, like the revs of an engine yeah. would. Um, and I thought it was quite fun. I'm, I'm not a fan yeah. of artificially enhancing an internal combustion engine like noise. M5 or something like that. But, you yeah. know, the flip side of that is, mm. in this car, I really quite enjoyed it. I thought okay. it was fun because it's quite clear what yeah. they're up to. How loud is it? Are you driving along it with quite it going... Loud. Beep, 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 yeah, it gets like quite that. loud. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I had a little drive of it as well. And it, it, if you're on full throttle, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, like, it's really, it's, yeah, it's really cool. Okay. One yeah, thing yeah. I did notice about that though, when I unplugged it um, from the charger, uh, and I just put the charger away and closed the bonnet because that's where mm. your yeah. storage area is, um, the uh, flap doesn't shut itself. Right. And so I was driving along thinking people were sort of like, oh, cool car, but they were actually like, yes. oh, your, your flaps, flaps open. Exactly. Flaps. I can see your flaps. That's true. <laughs> yeah. When I was when I was um, going to drive the car. I think it was uh, Mal and yeah, yes, yeah. and we picked Matt. it up too. And I'd done exactly the same thing; mm. felt like an absolute twit. And Matt, uh, Mal came up and shut the door yeah. Uh, yeah. on the charging. And that's form. something yeah. that in a well, in a Tesla, the the flap itself is only sort of like that big. Yeah, where close, this is, yeah. This is yeah. like this big. If Mate, you yeah. you could knock a cyclist over with that, oh, Matt, I'm very, leave it out. If only. I'm very pleased to hear that you did that as well. Yeah. Now I only feel half as silly. Yeah, so yeah that's, we're both silly. That's so. fantastic. Now. Um, I think it is time for us to move on to Musk Watch. Right, so big news is that the Model 3, Tesla Model 3, has topped Consumer Reports most satisfying cars to own survey. For 2019. Now, that is an annual survey of Consumer Report subscribers, uh, which it uses to determine the top 10 vehicles that leave shoppers the most satisfied by, quote, living up to their promises and their owners' experiences. So the so, brainwashing is working. So people wow. who have got their Tesla Model 3s are enjoying the experience. It, to- it was top of the list. I'm not sure what we- yeah. followed it or, or yeah. what have you, but it was top notch. I'm suspicious of that. I would like to know who conducted the test. Consumer reports, Richard. Yeah, but yeah, but that's just like saying sources say. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's consumer reports. But what consumer reports? It would be like saying a mag- a magazine called Consumer Reports. Oh. It's an online entity. Oh, okay. It's the name of the magazine. <laughs> I just thought you meant Consumer Reports. Like lowercase c, Obviously lowercase you did. R. Okay. So, so you hadn't heard of Consumer Reports. It's a reasonably well-known title. I did not. I have not okay. heard of them. All right. They're quite big, are they? Now you have. They're quite yeah, large. Right, okay. yeah. Look, the flip, okay. the flip side is that Elon's been on the Twitters overnight to yes. say the Model 3 is, quote, now at a starting price of $35,000, bracket, mm. after 8K of credits and fuel savings. So, right. so what that means is right he's actually using a whole of life cost equation to kind of retro calculate the new car price. So he's factoring in the you savings know. you'll make by not having to buy fuel. What? Um, and the 8K that you get from a government credit dep- it varies by state anyway. No. And people got after him. That's not that. There were a lot of people saying, oh, that's, that's terrific. And a lot of people saying, like, okay, Jason Cross said, come on, man. It's forty two nine hundred. It's forty two thousand nine hundred. Yeah, it's a, uh, It's supposed to be thirty five k period before tax incentives, fuel savings, maintenance savings, whatever. Playing these math games doesn't help me afford the car. No. And yeah, another no. guy I thought was a good one, Victor Stuber said, "I'm sorry, but you can't include fuel fuel savings into the price of a car." That's not how prices work. That's not how prices work. <laughs> but you're still yeah. paying, like, you've still got to pay for fuel. Like yeah, you, you pay, if, electricity. Yes, electricity costs, yeah, of course that's it right. does. Yeah. It's dumb. Yeah, it's really that's, dumb. And I don't mm. know why Elon's doing it. He's just doing it because he's Elon, mm. right? You're so. a massive fan, Richard. What are you doing? You've Look, turned I, around. I, I, hey, we go, I go hot and cold on Elon. Oh, um, obviously. I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I've gone a bit cold on him now. 
All right. He's messing with us. I All right. Like well, that. the Bloomberg Model 3 production tracker, um, this week we're at 4939. So That's it's right. just under that 5K. Mm. It's down 421 on the prior week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they'd had a couple of weeks above 5,000. Now they've kind of come back a bit. But hey, they're still up around the 5,000 it seems like, critical mark. It seems like, though, that I'm seeing a lot of uh, photos uh, from drones on Twitter saying that, you know, yeah, there's lots of them being built, but not many of them are finding owners. There's yeah, mate, lots in stockpiles. Well, that's either the stock situation is better and they're able to get them out to people that are buying them because mm. they've got a bigger float of, of vehicles or the reduction in um, um, incentives has maybe knocked a bit of a hole in demand. But mm. um, we'll see over mm. time. Um, but in other Elon news... Oh. Um, SpaceX has wrapped a rocket engine, and for those watching on YouTube, fingers crossed we'll have vision of that. You know, we'll be on site. If we were mm. there, we'd be uh, tinged oh. at this point. So it's going to be scheduled. Uh, it's been tested, and it's scheduled for launch in the Falcon 9 in 2020, and it is a spectacular. Yes. Like, that's a big candle, and yep. it's going to have several of those in it, and it'll probably end up taking Elon to Mars. So it's a significant test. Oh, I can't this wait for that is, day. So this Falcon 9, um, otherwise known as the... The big, F-ing I think rocket. there's Falcon Nine and yeah. then there's Falcon Heavy. Yeah, so uh, Falcon Heavy is the the Mars colonizing. Ah, uh, is it? Or I might have that. That's going to take, well, as Elon says, hundreds of people to Mars. Uh, mm. The first trip will be to the Moon. Uh, oh, okay. Loop the Moon, just a test. Come back again. Yep. Um, with artists on board and musicians and and every, everybody else like that yep. who've been chosen. Um, and then that will be the yeah that will be basically the prototype well, look, for the Mars one. Speaking of rockets, it's a year since Starman plonked himself into uh, the Tesla oh, Roadster, really? right? And and wow. rocketed off quite literally. Yeah. And according to whereisroadster.com, yeah. Uh, he's over 364 million kilometers from Earth. Travelling at 2.02 kilometres a second, wow. which is actually 7,272 kilometres an hour. Wow. And if the battery's still uh, primed, he's listened to Space Oddity 99,122 times. Oh, wow. wow. So we're coming up on 100,000 listens of Space Oddity. The vehicle has, according to whereisroadster.com, the vehicle has travelled far enough to drive all the world's roads 21 times. Wow. All Jeez. the world's roads. So, would that All still be collecting royalties? That song. I have no idea. My God! I mean, Could you I, well, David Bowie isn't it's not being it. broadcast. I know, but, but it wouldn't be being broadcast. Uh, maybe it's narrow. Maybe there's it's very very narrow has to do a satellite broadcast for it though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Elon would have looked into that. Elon. Okay, look, with that, we've reached the finish line. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, and thank you, Richard. Thank you, and thanks to our producer, Mr. Pritchard, on the buttons and sliders. To have your say on the show, search for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram and use the hashtag CGPodcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. You can listen to and watch us on YouTube. And if you're enjoying Tools in the Shed, why not recommend it to someone you know will like it too? Uh, Or go to a little broader uh, base by rating and reviewing us on iTunes. Until next week, Did you know that if you press a car's accelerator and brake pedals at the same time, it takes a screenshot? (laughs) Uh. (laughs) Does it? Uh.